chapter 6, verse 12, it says, One of those days Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose twelve of them, whom he also designated apostles. Simon, whom he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called a zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. May the Lord have his blessing and hearing to this reading of his holy word. Uh, let's take a moment to pray. pray. Dear God, we pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Start out today by asking you if this has ever happened to you. Have you ever been out in a town, say your mother or Tanny or somewhere, and, and you call home and you talk to whoever you might be there, maybe it's a spouse or a husband or wife or a parent or a child or someone, um, and you say, hey, I'm in town, do we need anything before I come home? And they say, yeah, right? They say, yeah, uh, I'm making dinner and I, I need some salad dressing, grab me some salad dressing. And you're like, sure, it's the grocery store's right there, so you, you go and you park. And in the parking lot, you go in the grocery store, and you go on uh, to the aisle for the salad dressing, because everyone knows right off where the salad dressing aisle is. But you go, and, and you turn to the salad dressing, and what do you see? You see a wall of salad dressing, right? How do you choose? Because, you, you know, first you can say, well, well, what kind do we like? Oh, well, uh, there's, there, there's food. We have crab, we have Hidden Valley, we've got Wishbone, we, we've got Heinz, they make some uh, salad dressing. We've got Kent Steakhouse, we've got Newman's Zone. There's some organic stuff there that the healthy people tell us is good for us. What do we get? We say, well, we like wishbones, so we'll take wishbones. Oh, right, there you go, right? You've made your choice, right? No. Because now, like, oh, oh. you know, instead of a wall, you've got a space this big to deal with, with you know, the wishbone. You know, the wishbone makes ranch, Catalina, Italian, French, vinaigrette, blue cheese, Caesar, Thousand Island, maybe some other things I didn't find. Oh, I want a bottle of salad dressing. <laughs> well, you know, it might not be everyone's favorite, but Italian dressing. Everyone can mostly agree with that, so you want Italian. All right! <laughs> Wishbone makes, makes bruschetta Italian, Mediterranean Italian, light Italian, fat free Italian, creamy Italian, robusto Italian, five cheese Italian, house Italian, and regular old Italian, which makes me wonder why anyone would want that regular old Italian, because obviously something's wrong with it, right? Since they have to have all these other points. Be like, all I want is a bottle of salad dressing. So by this time, it's disgusting. You just grab one, you take it, you pay for it, you take it home, and you hand it to them, and they count, look at your fun. They say, here's the salad dressing. And then they say, well, we're having macaroni salad. I need dressing for, uh, like, mayonnaise or something to dress this salad. And you're like, oh, choices. They give away, don't they? You know, that's life. Well, it's all about choices. We have so many. If you make the right choices, well, probably some good things will come your way. If you make the wrong choices, well, some not good things are probably going to come away some bad things. Case in point, I remember, uh, this was years ago, I was driving up north. I think I was driving through Titusville. I was heading to some of my friend's wedding up north, and uh, I've never been to Titusville before, and I haven't been since. But it's not a huge place, but I got there on a Friday afternoon, and then, so there was a lot of traffic, and I didn't know where I was going. I just knew, coming up real soon, I had to make a left-hand turn. And so I'm going, I'm coming to an intersection. Is this it? I don't know. I make a choice. And I turn, I make that left hand turn. And, and I, I turn on this wide Broadway with two nice two lanes. And I look ahead, and there is this mass of cars coming toward me in both lanes. I turn down one lane road, and I was going the wrong way. Luckily, there was a wide sidewalk. And I just drove right up on that sidewalk. And I bet the people in those shots just had wonderful stories to tell them. We talked about making choices. I, I bet there were some choice words from the drivers of those vehicles coming my way that day. You know, I made a wrong choice, and I kind of got into a situation I didn't want to be in. And that's the way it is. When we talk about choices, and some of the choices we need to make are much weightier than, oh, which way do I turn, or what salad dressing do I, do I want? Uh, we have real choices to make. Uh, where am I going to live? Should I stay in this area? Should I go elsewhere? You, you've probably all been there asking that question. Where am I going to work? What job should I have? What career should I go into? You're working. Do you need to work more? Do you need to change jobs? Uh, can you work more to make more money? Do you need to maybe work less? Can you afford to work less so that you can spend more time with your family? So that uh, when God calls you into his service, you can respond. Uh, and, and you're not just dead tired from working so often. All choices. 
what kind of car should I get? Because it's, it's, it's going to be years before I buy another one. It's expensive. You don't want to make the wrong choice. Should I get married? Who should I marry? For those in school, what classes should I take? I've got three bills to pay this month, and only enough money to pay for two of them. What can I do without this month? All choices. That Matt is saying, and they're uh, a little bit weightier than salad dressing, aren't they? But there are choices other than that and that really deal with our spiritual life as well. A lot of times we don't even think about that. Like, you get up in the morning, how am I going to serve God today? You know, that's a choice we make every day. Many of us make no choice there just because we don't even think about it. But that's our choice. We don't serve God. Uh, is my life set up so that I can call, I, I can serve God with calls? What do I need to change in my life so that I can have that complete life that God desires to give me? That's there. Those are all important decisions, all important choices. How do we make those choices? Did you ever think about it? What process do we follow? Some of you, you, you might make lists. You might actually get a piece of paper and make a line down the middle and write pros and cons. You write them all out and you compare them. A lot of people do that. Even if you don't make the list, you do it in your mind. You go back and forth. What's good, what's bad. Some people seek advice from some people. Uh, hopefully they're wise people when you're trying to make a choice. Others of us, we make a choice by just procrastinating. The world chooses for us just because we fail to act. We just don't do anything. We just take what comes. Others of us, you know, let's be honest. We choose whatever's the most fun, whatever's the easiest at the time. Don't we? That's how we make choices. Those are our processes. And sometimes those models work for us. And sometimes those models don't. I, I think it's interesting that we, as followers of Jesus Christ in the church, we have the greatest model for making choices there. And we often just overlook at it. Uh, we, we often just overlook at it. And, and it's Jesus Christ himself is the ultimate model for making choices. Because have you ever thought about the fact that Jesus never made a wrong choice? Can you imagine never having made a wrong choice? I, I mean, we read about it all the time in the Bible, all the choices Jesus had to make, and he makes the right one. We read in Matthew chapter 4, where, where Jesus, he's baptized, and he is sent by the Holy Spirit out to the wilderness, where he fasts from food and water for 40 days, and at the end of those days, he is hungry, and he is thirsty, and then what happens? The devil comes. That's when the devil comes with all, every trick he has try to tempt Jesus into walking out of God's will. Try to get Jesus to fail at what God has sent him to do. And, and, and Jesus' response, he chooses to resist. You say, well, yeah, you're tempted by the devil. That's the obvious choice. You choose to resist. But how often do we fail to make that choice? We don't do it will. We often choose not to resist. So Jesus, he makes the wise choice. Resist. We find other places in Jesus' ministry. And he's faced with hard questions. He's faced with critics who want to come at him. And Jesus, instead of getting into brawls with them and getting into petty arguments, Jesus chooses to use wisdom to be wise in saying things to them. Case in point, Matthew 22, Jesus is there casting out demons and his critics say, uh-huh. That's not the Bible. That's the, the, the devil's work. The devil did that for him. And Jesus... <laughs> He just says, he uses wisdom. He chooses to use wisdom and say, you're not making sense. You know, if you say those demons are from the devil, and you say, I'm, I'm fighting against them and I'm from the devil, that, that, that doesn't make sense. But he silences his critics by choosing to be wise. Jesus made wise choices. We read in today's scripture passage another place where Jesus makes a wise choice. We see here Jesus choosing the apostles, the twelve. We see Jesus, he comes to a place in his ministry, and he knows eventually he's going to be leaving this earth. Uh, he will uh, be taken back up into heaven, and he's going to leave his church, this thing he births and, and takes and creates by what he's doing here. He's going to leave it into the hands of these men who he's going to choose here. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, they're going to establish and build his church and think about all that the church is. Think about all that it is even today. Uh, all the good that has been done over the centuries by the church. All the good that continues to be done today. The millions of people who have found peace and joy with God through the salvation of Jesus Christ because of the work of the church. That these men are going to be responsible for building when Jesus is taken up in heaven. Jesus faces this choice. He's like, that's a hard, that's a huge choice. Who should they be? How many of them should there be? 
choices. You know, you look at Jesus and you say, well, how did he make that choice? What's his process? And can his process help us when we face all our choices in everyday life? You better believe it can. One word will describe Jesus' process for making choices. Prayer. Prayer. And so we see here this sermon about choices. It's actually a sermon about prayer. So that's what Jesus does. You know, when we say, well, duh, obviously you've got to pray before you make a big decision. Why do we ignore that when we say we were in church and we say, duh, yeah, yeah, but we ignore it, don't we? Often we see prayer, that's the last thing we do, isn't it? We get everything else done, we've done everything we can do. Well, guess we'll pray. I found a story this week uh, about a, a ship and it was sinking, and the captain, he's there and he shouts out as the ship's going down, Does anyone here know how to pray? And, and one man covering the race in his hand says, Yes, skipper, I do. And the captain says, Well, good then. You pray, the rest of us will put on these light belts. We're one short. Right? And isn't that how we, we handle prayer? It's just like, All right, we've got no other choice, so you pray. That's not how Jesus handled prayer. I mean, when he had a choice to make, Prayer was the first thing on his agenda when it came to making a decision. Our text today, Luke chapter 6, verse 12, it says, One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. And it goes on to say that the next morning, he gets up and then he makes his choice. See what Jesus did. The first thing Jesus does when he has a decision to make, a choice, is he sets his mind on praying. This is so important because, you know, pray. We know we're supposed to do this when we have a decision to make, but we don't do it. And it's easy just to skip over because we don't set our minds. But Jesus sets his mind to pray. Uh, what do we do instead? Well, you know, what do we do? Don't we usually, don't we usually make a decision? We say, all right, God, here's what we're going to do. Bless it. Right? And then when things don't go quite right, we look at God and say, God, why is this happening to me? Why am I going through this? It's because we made a decision. Outside of prayer. You know, I, I found a story this week about a man named Bill. Not you. Uh, but, uh, well, maybe, well, maybe it's him. So many Bills. No, Bill. His name's Bill. And uh, he's approaching midlife. And physically, he's a mess. Uh, he, he, he's balding. And years of desk work has given him a pot belly. And I know you think it's about me, right? But uh, it's Bill. And to top things off, he goes and he asks a female co-worker out on a date. And she all but laughs at him. So he says, that's it. Uh, I'm going to start a new record. He goes and he enrolls in some aerobics classes, and he starts lifting weights, and he gets an expensive hair transplant, and he changes his diet, and six months later, he's a brand new man. I, like, yeah, he's all confident himself, and he goes up to this woman, he asks her out, hey, guess what she says? She says, yeah. He's like, yes, it worked. And so he's all there, and he, he's you know, approaches her house to pick her up on the date, and he goes up to the front door, and he goes to ring the doorbell, and he reaches out, and from heaven, there is this bolt of lightning that strikes him, knocks him off his feet. And as he's on his back, dying, he cries out, God, God, why? Why, after everything, did you do this to me now? And then there's just this voice from heaven. It's God. He says, oh, sorry. I didn't recognize you. <laughs> <laughs> isn't that, isn't that? <laughs> How often is that us? We order our lives, our own, our own ideas, our own decisions. And then things don't work out. And we say, God, after everything, how did you do this to me? That's what we do. So the first thing we need to see in Jesus is that intent to make prayer important when he is facing an important decision, a choice. You know what? That intent. It takes time to pray and it takes effort. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. I think that's so often why people don't pray as much as because it's hard work. But it takes time and effort. And we see Jesus making that time. We talked about that last week. Jesus centered his life around making that time. We need to do that too. Don't skip it. No, prayer is the important part of making the decision. When we pray, once we set our mind to pray, we want to do it right, don't we? Because we want right results. We've got to do it right. And that's what Jesus did. Jesus didn't just pray, but he set the praying right. And look what he did in this passage. The first thing he tells us is that he went out onto a mountainside. <laughs> you know, he didn't stick around where all the people were crowding around him wanting something from him and say, oh, just Every once in a while, I'll just throw a thought at God. That'll be enough. You know what? That's not I think everyone should do that throughout the day, but that can't be the beginning and end of your prayer life. And Jesus uh, knew that. He didn't stick around where his critics were there, drowning out the voice of his father. You know, he didn't even stick around where his disciples were sleeping, but he went to a mountainside, a 
quiet place for him, a place where he can get away without distraction and hear the Father. Now, it's so important when we pray, and, and when we forget this too, that we need to find our own mountainside. Because if you don't find that quiet place, it might be a quiet room, it might be your backyard, it might be a quiet street in your town where you can take a walk. Find it, because if you don't, you're going to be distracted. You'll be distracted by things. Suddenly those, those little things uh, uh, in your life become the most important things when you try to pray. Does this ever happen to anybody? It happened to me this Thursday, I swear it was the devil working. Uh, I'm sitting and, and I, I was praying in the study at the church, getting ready to preach this message. And I, I usually don't pray in the study when I'm here. I pray elsewhere here. But I thought, I'll just sit here and pray. I didn't go to my quiet I didn't go to my mountainside. And, and, you know, so many things. Right, you know, suddenly it was like, oh, I have receipts here. And I have to fill out expense forms uh, all month. And I need to uh, take care of this. And I've been talking to Marianne about Bible school. And I said, oh, I, I need to figure out what's, what we're doing with this music for Bible school. And I found myself reaching for these things at the desk and having to chastise myself. Say, no, you are praying. Because I didn't go to that mountainside. I didn't go to the quiet place. And I was distracted. You know, Jesus, he went to the mountainside so that he wouldn't be distracted. So he could pray when he had a choice to make. How often do we skip this? You know, Jesus didn't make any choice of import without going to his Father in a place where he could be alone with his Father. And we shouldn't either. The other thing that Jesus did right when it came to time to pray about his choices, he allowed time for the Father to speak to him. Notice that the scripture says Jesus spent the night praying to God. Until morning came, and then he goes out and makes his choice. Now, when you've got a major choice to make, don't just uh, talk to God real fast, and then immediately go out and do what you were going to do anyway. Who here has ever done that? Am I the only one? Oh, some honest people. Thank you. you know, I found a story about little Johnny. Little Johnny got in trouble, and his mom sent us to his room. His mom sent him to his room. And, and um, a few moments later, he comes back to his mom. I talk about it. Pray to God for help. And little Johnny's mom seemed to be a little pleased by this. And she said, Look, you pray to God to help you behave, and He will help you. Little Johnny said, I didn't ask Him to help me behave. I asked Him to help you tolerate me. <laughs> I think I've had that conversation before. Yeah. But isn't that what we do? We ask God to help us and tell Him what we're going to do. And then we go out and immediately just start doing it, don't we? Uh, and if he doesn't send a tornado to knock us off our feet immediately and say, oh, I'm making the choice God doesn't want me to make. I'm in his will. That's what we do. But that's not how Jesus did it. Jesus prayed all night. He had time to hear the Father. It wasn't a one-way conversation with Jesus just throwing things at the Father and then going on. Isn't that what we do? Is that why we make bad choices all the time? Because we don't stop and listen to the Father. God, here's my plan. Please rubber stamp it. I need to go. No time to chat. I'm on my way. Now, when Jesus faced his disciple, who's he going to choose to be his apostles? And he knew that some people wouldn't understand why he chose the people did. He knew some people would be hurt. They'd be confused. They'd be wondering, why wasn't I chosen? And so he takes time to talk to his Father about all these things and to hear what his Father has to tell him about that. He models for us what his word says in Ephesians 5, 17, where it says, Do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And to understand God's will, it takes time for us to listen to him. Jesus took that necessary time to understand God's will. How about you? When there's a choice to make, and maybe you're being a good Christian that day, and you say to mind, I'm going to pray. You pray, and then just stop. Listen to her so that you can understand God's will. Now, as you wait on God in prayer, the Father, He's going to come. He's going to start by His Holy Spirit revealing things to you and talking to you. He's going to uh, help you to understand things like how this decision is going to impact your spiritual life and how this decision will impact the people around you you love, your friends, your family, people you care for. He's going to help you understand, hey, that person that you want to be at the end of all this, that sanctified, holy person, he's going to help you understand how that guy would make this decision, what decision he would make. That's what happens when we stop and listen to the Father when we pray. Now, all too often, we can just go and do it. We've got to listen to him before we go and make our decision and do it and end up in a place where we say, God, why is this happening? 
You know, Jesus, he made his decision after he left time to listen to his Father. You know, after his time of prayer, Jesus went and made choices. And he made the choices for the apostles, and they were the best choices. They were the perfect choices. Look at what they accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit, ladies and gentlemen. We sit here today as a result of what those 12 men did. That choice that Jesus made right there. He did it by going to God in prayer. Notice Jesus having picked his men, he never gets to a place where he prays to God, God, I need a do-over. He's never out there saying, God, how do we get to this place? Because Jesus was intent on praying for all of life's crucial choices. He was intent on doing it right, getting away to those quiet places, a free of distraction. He was intent on waiting and listening for the Father to talk to him. You know, Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7 is familiar to many of you probably. And it says, in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And the verse talks about that peace of God. It transcends everything. It surpasses everything. He says, you can have it. You can have that peace of God if you do what the verse says. If you pray. If you want Jesus to intent on praying. And to pray like Jesus. Get to that quiet place and wait for the Father to speak to you. Stop and listen. You know, if you do that, it doesn't mean the Lord's, the world's going to line up behind you all in order then because you did that. There's still going to be things in this world that come at you that are completely out of your control and you have no choice about it. But you will be at peace because you have sought God in prayer for the choices you make. You know, being a follower of Jesus Christ it means we make God-directed choices. What choices face you today? What decisions do you have to make? Maybe they're silly ones. Maybe you're facing some important things. God's not going to leave you alone there. He wants you to come to Him, so He can, you can hear what He has to tell you. The follow Jesus Christ can make God-directed choices. Those God-directed choices, they're found in prayer. So today I challenge you, be that follower of Jesus Christ. Be that person. 